Okay, I think we'll get started here. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the panel, Who Funds Your News? Transparency and Nonprofit Journalism. I'm Karen Lincoln Michelle. I am Assistant Managing Editor at the Green Bay Press Gazette and uh, also a board member of the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism. So uh, welcome, everyone. And it's uh, really great to be back here in Madison. I was a State House Bureau Chief here for the Press Gazette a few years back, and it was always uh, exciting and always something happening. And uh, the last 103 days uh, have been no exception. So uh, I'd like to get started and first of all introduce our panelists. And um, to my immediate left is Andy Hall. Andy is founder and executive director of the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism. And as you know, that's a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, and it was launched two years ago. And it examines government integrity and quality of life issues. And it has become a model for other local investigative uh, journalism news organizations. Uh, the center collaborates with uh, Wisconsin Public Radio, Wisconsin Public Television, uh, UW-Madison School of Journalism and Mass Communication, mainstream journalism, and uh, ethnic media as well. Uh, Andy uh, was an investigative reporter with the Wisconsin State Journal and also with the Arizona Republic where he helped break the Keating Five scandal. Andy has numerous awards and also is a member of the Investigative News Network and serves on the Iowa Center for Public Affairs Journalism. And he's also a board, uh, he's also on the Indiana University Journalism Alumni Advisory Board. Welcome to Andy. Thank you. Uh, seated next to Andy is Brant Houston. And Brant is the Knight Chair in Investigative and Enterprise Reporting at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. He teaches investigative and advanced reporting. He's co-author of the Investigative Reporter's Handbook and author of Computer Assisted Reporting, A Practical Guide. Brandt is chair of the board of directors of the Investigative News Network, and that is a consortium of more than 50 nonprofit newsrooms in North America, and he is co-founder of the Global Investigative Journalism Network. Brandt also is board president of the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism, and he serves on several other nonprofit journalism boards. Uh, before becoming night chair, Brant was executive director of IRE, the uh, Investigative Reporters and Editors, and the National Institute for Computer Assisted Reporting for 12 years. Brant also has won numerous awards, um, and he uh, shared in a, um, a Pulitzer Prize for coverage of a hotel building collapse that killed 114 persons in 1981, and that was at uh, the Kansas City Star. Seated next to Brandt is Arthur Brisbane, and he is the fourth public editor for the New York Times. And he got his uh, first job in journalism in 1976 as a reporter at the Glen Cove, Guardian, Glen Cove Guardian on Long Island. A year later, he joined the Kansas City Times as a reporter and in 1979 became a columnist. In 1984, he moved to the Washington Post before becoming an assistant city editor and then a national reporter. Uh, Arthur returned to Kansas City in 1990 to write a column for the Kansas City Star. He was appointed editor of the newspaper and in 1992, uh, and, and five years later then became the publisher of the paper. In 2005, Knight Ritter named him senior vice president with responsibility for overseeing the operations of its papers in Philadelphia, Kansas City, Fort Worth, Charlotte, and others. And he is a graduate of Harvard College. Welcome to Arthur. Um, we're going to get started here to talk about our um, uh, topic here today on transparency. And you know, all of you know that the news industry in recent years has uh, been undergoing a transformation. And in that, there have been limited uh, resources in, an, in, a, in a number of areas because of uh, uh, cutbacks. And unfortunately, one of those cutbacks has been in watchdog journalism. So groups like the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism and other nonprofit news organizations have really stepped up to the plate to fill that void. And so today we're talking about uh, the traditional news media and their increasing use of these uh, uh, news organizations' content. 
And so along with that, they receive uh, money from outside sources. And so the issue has become at times whether or not um, you know, they need to disclose who uh, is funding them. So it's important to note that all of our panelists today believe that transparency matters and uh, that it's important to be upfront about funding and other important information for news media to know, for public policy makers to know, and for the public. And so I think it's important also to mention that extensive efforts were made to include as panelists members of nonprofit organizations that do not practice transparency, uh, but those invitations were declined. Those organizations are the uh, Franklin Center of Government and Public Integrity, the Sam Adams Alliance, and the MacGyver Institute. And we regret, we regret that their voices will not be heard here today. So with that, we're going to uh, begin our discussion, and we will um, hear from each panelist, and then we're going to eventually take questions from the audience. So we plan to have a really um, great discussion here, and we're going to start with Andy. Well, good morning. Uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, for those of you who don't live in Madison, I'm sorry you missed spring. It, it was from about 2 to 6 p.m. on Wednesday. <laughs> try, try again next year, I guess. Um, th this is a, uh, I guess, uh, to use a technical term, a super important issue uh, for those of us in the nonprofit journalism world. And I think as the panel uh, moves ahead, you'll also hear uh, that if it isn't on the radar uh, for the not for the for-profit journalists um, in, in, the, in the landscape across the country, it really ought to be. Um, with the rise of, of the nonprofit news organizations, um, uh, our content is being picked up in many cases by for-profit news organizations, and sometimes uh, we're not being thoughtful enough about the circumstances under which our reporting was paid for and, and perhaps not enough uh, care is being taken to, to size us up uh, before the collaborations take place. So it's in that spirit that uh, we're, we're holding uh, the discussion here this morning. And if I can uh, get the technology to work maybe just uh, a bit better than it did for the previous panel, let's see what happens here. All right, good. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about uh, who funds uh, your news, and before we get up into the clouds and talk about concepts, I thought it might be useful for us to just talk a little bit about how we got here today. Uh, this panel really is an outgrowth of the ethics roundtable uh, that Professor Ward uh, hosted here in Madison on what seemed to be like the coldest day of the winter, last winter back in uh, early 2010. And a number of us uh, got together uh, from uh, for-profit, non-profit uh, news organizations to spend an entire day uh, focusing upon some particular ethics issues that confront non-profit investigative newsrooms. So this, this was the report uh, that, was, that was produced out of that. And I'm, I'm sure everybody has, has read it and has memorized it. But um, you know, some of the main points uh, are up here on the screen. Um, the, uh, the findings uh, included, first of all, an emphasis upon uh, figuring out our own missions, our own sense of purpose. Why, why are we here and what are, what, are the, um, what are the goals of our news organizations? Then, uh, particularly important and one we're going to focus on a lot today, uh, being transparent about who's funding our work. Uh, and by transparent, we'll get into that uh, in a bit. Um, and then establishing guidelines for conflicts of interest, uh, for how we're going to handle ethics issues uh, that arise, and then communicating uh, those, uh, those standards uh, to the public, uh, to the potential funders out there, as well as to the members of the public. Um, because, you know, really these are experiments, and um, it, if, if we don't talk about the issues and what works and what doesn't, um, it's going to be hard to really uh, capture the learning. Okay, so um, 
here's our page at the, uh, at the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism. Um, and you'll notice our main areas of coverage are laid out here, uh, the economy and education, the environment, uh, government, government integrity, health and welfare, and justice and public safety issues. And then under uh, about up here, uh, that, of course, is the traditional place for places for people to learn about an organization. So we've put a lot of work into what happens when you click about. Uh, one of those is you, know, you quickly are taken to our ethics and diversity statement uh, to see the, um, that we first of all endorse uh, the Society of Professional Journalist standards, but we also have some additional conflict of interest uh, and, and diversity declarations uh, listed here. Uh, and again, I think it's really important that viewers, uh, the members of the public, readers, uh, potential funders, other journalists can see this information about us in just a couple clicks. Uh, then there's also a funding page, and at the top part of the page, you see a listing of the, our major donors, uh, places like the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation, the Open Society Institute, the McCormick Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the EVU Foundation, others, uh, and we pretty much say the exact amounts even that we receive from the foundations. Um, then moving ahead, uh, at the bottom part of the page, additional donors, uh, we list every single uh, person who is sending us money. And uh, this is all flowing out of a fundraising policy, um, or maybe we had a fancier name for it, like revenue generation policy or something like that, that the Board of Directors approved last year after that, after that ethics roundtable. And it requires us uh, to disclose the identity of, of every single donor. Uh, and that furthermore, uh, there are certain standards for acceptance of various types of donations. General operating support is, is taken, you know, with very few, uh, relatively few concerns because it, it can be used for anything the organization wants to do. Um, but donations targeted toward areas of coverage, such as education, the environment, um, the, our requirement is that as we spend that money, we need to disclose the particular types of work that were, that were funded uh, by those donations and then even tighter restrictions regarding acceptance of money for specific projects. That in that case, you would then see um, a disclosure with that story saying this project was supported by a grant from uh, whoever. Uh, so we're just trying to be transparent. You can also click and see our um, uh, IRS Form 990, which gives a, a, a basic summary of how much money we're taking in, where are we spending it? Uh, how much money uh, am, am I being paid? What do we spend on rent, which is zero because we're based in the uh, in the J School? Uh, happy to say, um, and in exchange for that, we provide educational services uh, to the School of Journalism. And then, um, when we ask people to donate to us, uh, we make it clear on this page that um, you know we're going to um, publicly acknowledge our donors to increase the transparency and protect the integrity of our public interest journalism. Um, so that's a look at some of the things we're trying to do at the Wisconsin Center. Um, I would have to say overall uh, it's working well. Uh, there were some concerns that uh, perhaps the emphasis on public disclosure might discourage some people from, from giving to us, uh, but ultimately the board decided that uh, in the scheme of things we needed to put the highest priority on protecting the integrity of our journalism, even if that meant that it's somewhere down the line. Um, we have to say no to a potential donation. So I think I'll leave it at that for the moment. That's great. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. And I think we'll uh, let the panelists uh, have a few minutes to uh, address the audience, and then I'm going to come back with a couple of uh, follow-up questions. So next is Brant Houston. OK. Uh, I was hoping we might be able to get the Investigative News Network up there. Uh, we talk about it. Um, obviously, I'm very involved with what I believe was uh, truly a grassroots uh, movement out of the last three years, a migration of journalists from what had been mainstream for-profit newsrooms to nonprofit, so that uh, they could continue doing good work, doing investigative work uh, in public service and public interest work. Um, what happened uh, a couple of years ago is that uh, 
uh, suddenly everyone that was working on these state centers uh, and some national centers realized that uh, we could do a lot more by getting together and uh, discussing better ways to work together and to pool resources. So um, out of a meeting that was, I believe, in uh, July 2009, June, July 2009, of 20 nonprofit centers, uh, we created something called the Investigative News Network. And the Investigative News Network uh, was created primarily for three, three things, three reasons. That's three goals, which are, one is to pool administrative resources wherever possible. Um, one outcome of that has been working with a media insurance company to get um, d discounts for members. Uh, that pass that insurance company's criteria and saves money on, on insurance. But there are many other things that we can do, sharing uh, administrative tips. One of, to me, one of the funny ones initially was that uh, almost no other member except one knew about something called freeconference.com, uh, which is an incredibly uh, good way to have free conference calls. People just have to dial in from their own phone. And, uh, and that was saving hundreds of dollars to individual centers. Um, uh, so we, that, the pooling resources was one. A second goal was to uh, enable more editorial collaborations, set up systems where uh, different members of the network could work on stories they had common interest in. Uh, something s even simple for that was there's a program called Basecamp that makes it easy to work on projects together. I think it's initially put together for uh, software development, but it's turned out to be very useful for doing an investigative project that involves seven, eight different members of the network. Um, the third part was to find new revenue streams. Uh, the message from foundations, national foundations, has been very clear that we're good for startup money, and hopefully that startup money for more than one year, uh, but you guys have to figure out how to sustain yourselves, uh, make sure that you're valuable to your uh, community, and, uh, and find other ways to raise money. Um, one uh, obvious way to do that is to distribute content, and the um, Investigative News Network recently signed a contract with Reuters uh, for distribution of members' content. It's totally opt-in. But uh, what's unique about that is that um, Reuters was willing to share the revenue. If you watch the news now, many of the nonprofits, nonprofits are giving away their content. Other people are using it to make money off of it or to sell themselves to something like AOL for $300 million. Uh, we really feel that content has value and the people who produce it should get, should get paid for it in some way. Um, so by having, now we've moved from 20 to more than 50 uh, nonprofit newsrooms, uh, clearly had something to offer in bulk uh, to Reuters. So and in that, uh, the members would benefit by getting percentages of, if this experiment works, uh, uh, getting percentages of the revenue that come out of that. So, all a great idea. Um, it wasn't formed by a bunch of utopists, uh, but I think we have gone into it with high expectations. Of course, once you get into the sophomore year of anything, you get down to the nitty gritty. And uh, it was clear from the beginning we would have to have some kind of membership standards. Because over the past decade in particular, uh, nonprofits have uh, uh, been used as fronts for political uh, campaigns and so forth, um, and you really need to know who you're, who you're dealing with. So we had to come up with standards that include such things as as much transparency as possible, uh, the production of nonpartisan uh, work, and notice I said production nonpartisan work. Uh, it is possible for somebody with a very strong editorial leaning, as we've seen, to produce nonpartisan work. Uh, for example, over the years, the Wall Street Journal, I think, has been one of the places where you found the most difference in the news content, the editorial content, in terms of point of view. Um, so in order to, um, to start the process, we formed a membership and standards committee. And so we have a series of questions that we ask people. How do you identify your donors? How open are you with your budget, et cetera, et cetera? All the kinds of things that Andy, I won't replicate it, what he said. All those kinds of things come up. During this uh, 
this uh, second year of, of operations, uh, we, we understood from the beginning, but we understand better now, there are certain nuances when you go through this process. And there are certain nonprofit newsrooms that have been around for a long time that um, may have different stages in which they uh, reveal donors. Or uh, you may have someone like Consumer Reports that would like to be a member that has so many donors that identifying all of them um, could possibly be burdensome, uh, you know, if they're giving five, ten, fifteen dollars. Uh, so there, these are kinds of issues we we have to deal with. Um, but our biggest concern, I mean, the reason we're doing this is we want to always consider the source of any news that comes out and where the funding's from and what kind of influence it has. You know, it, it was simpler in a lot of ways when you had a for-profit operation that's mostly uh, uh, backed by advertising. Your donors, I put that in quotes, uh, told you clearly who they were and wanted you to see them often. Uh, as I was told when I moved to a nonprofit in 1994, said, and I said, oh, it would be great going to a nonprofit and donors and all, and all that. And uh, this friend said, well, you know, when you're in the for-profit newsroom, you have advertisers, now you're going to have donors. And I think what he was trying to say to me is that you have a struggle to push back on advertiser influence uh, when you're in for-profit or in the old, in the legacy media, and now you will have to make sure that you set up firewalls with your donors if you want to uh, perform with integrity. So those are issues i um, happy to talk about them. I don't want to go on too long at this point. But, you know, the, um, the currency we, we have right now is credibility. We have credibility if people know who we are and who's paying for it. It's that simple. And that's what we really have to do because we're living right now, uh, especially with the web, in a world in which it's easy to lie, it's easy to be deceptive, it's easy to make things up, it's easy to fight facts by just repeating a fiction over and over again. And so when you're living in a world of deception and sneaks, I think people are really going to look for the people who aren't. And I'm very disappointed that we don't have the anti-transparency people here because I think it would be good to hear their voice. I think it's a little ironic or maybe fitting that they're not here to speak. Um, you know, they don't know us to know who their donors are. On their particular websites, they make it clear that under IRS law, they do not have to identify uh, their donors and thus they promise anonymity. And I think we've got to, you know, move ahead in the world right now and be able to stand up and say who we support and who we are and uh, let people decide on whether we're too influenced or not by looking at what we produce. Okay? Thanks. Right, right. Thanks, Brent, and that you bring up a really good uh, issue about credibility and that's sort of uh, the root of it. But we'll get back to that topic in a bit. Um, Art? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Um, uh, I currently serve as the public editor of the New York Times, and I think a word about what that means might be good at the start. Uh, I don't speak for the New York Times. Sometimes uh, a person might, might assume that. I, I'm really an outsider uh, with an office in their building, and I'm uh, interested and enjoy speaking about the New York Times. So, uh, one of the consequences of all that is that <clears throat> I don't know exactly what goes on inside the minds of uh, the Times leadership, because strangely enough, they don't tell me. Uh, but I thought uh, I would address uh, this morning why a for-profit uh, organization, news organization, <clears throat> would want to use uh, content from nonprofit news organizations and then kind of go through some of the issues that uh, arise when that happens. Uh, some of this is uh, as basic as, as uh, Brian and Andy's uh, comments would indicate, and that is that uh, there's been a decline in the production of in-depth journalism, and it's fundamentally a product of commercial conditions. It's just as basic as that. Um, Many newspapers, I'm speaking mostly about newspapers because that's what I know more about, uh, are looking to fill a gap. Now at the New York Times, it's a little different because the New York Times, while it did undergo a certain number of cuts, it has remained an incredibly robust news organization. 
I am absolutely amazed uh, uh, in the eight months that I've uh, uh, worked in this position uh, what the level of resources there are, uh, some of which you, you can see in the print <coughs> product, which I'm sure most of you uh, look at, but also on the web. Um, a ton of additional content is published to the web and is only published to the web. And that means that there are a great number of content producers who are only working on that side of the business. And on top of that, there are lots of people who are technically facilitating that. So it's really uh, an organization that uh, seems to have expanded and not contracted during the period of economic stress that we all are aware of. Uh, so the purposes of the New York Times in using not-for-profit content are perhaps a little different. And to some extent, I'm offering uh, what I've heard, and to some extent, I'm just offering the best inference I can give based on what I see. And what I think is going on there is the underlying motive for using this kind of content is that, uh, A, it's available. B, it's a good deal cheaper uh, than it is to hire people and produce the content with your own employees who require health benefits and, and need pensions. Uh, those are two fundamental things. Uh, it's available. It's, uh, it's more cost effective, to use a term that might not be that comfortable a term to hear in a context of journalism, um, because I see some shaking heads <laughs> to indicate. But uh, as Jim uh, Boffman uh, told us in his opening uh, lecture, commercial considerations uh, in ways that may be very uncomfortable to us as journalists have driven the shape, the very shape, of our organizations. And so we shouldn't be unmindful of those uh, influences. Um, one of the things I think that is going on at the New York Times is that beyond just the question of surviving uh, the difficult uh, commercial conditions that news finds itself in, the Times sees an enormous opportunity to expand and grow. Uh, when you consider that the print product is holding its circulation fairly well, and that it's uh, nytimes.com plus its iPad and mobile applications have enormously expanded its audience and transformed it from not a, uh, an American uh, publication to a global publication, uh, that the opportunity to grab market share, to stick with the business metaphors, is enormous. So I, um, I think some of these reasons explain um, acquiring and using not-for-profit content. It's high-quality content. Certainly, high-quality content is available from not-for-profit organizations. You have a question, so I have to ask you, what is your question? <laughs> Let me start again. As a struggling journalist who's not getting paid, I don't see how ethically you can use more than a small set of information under the fair use content from a nonprofit source well, well, without me, recognizing sure. that there are those folks that are not getting paid because it is, in your words, well, cost well, effective. Well, let me explain then because I've probably not communicated well. I'm not saying the New York Times doesn't pay for the content. It does pay for the content. But it's, it's cheaper to acquire content from a third-party provider, like a not-for-profit news organization, than it is to hire a like number of individuals to come in and, and work for you as an employee. It's just a, an economic fact. And, and uh, so I'll give you a, an illustration that I think captures what I'm trying to say. Uh, in uh, three locations in the US, uh, San Francisco area, Chicago area, and Texas, the Times is contracted with not-for-profit organizations to produce two print pages uh, twice a week in the paper. Uh, in San Francisco, it's the Bay Citizen. Chicago, it's the Chicago News Cooperative. And in Texas, it's the Texas Tribune. Um, so these are uh, instances where uh, the alternative for the Times would be to hire its own journalists to produce this which is a pretty significant volume of news every week, but instead chooses to contract out with these not-for-profit organizations. Um, and uh, I think it's an economic uh, decision, and, and it harks back to the two concepts I tried to start with. Uh, doing this, though, entails uh, 
uh, uh, an obligation on the part of the Times to uh, vet the organizations that it does these kinds of things with. So the Times does undertake to do that. I've, I've questioned them about it. I know that they do. They, uh, they, uh, they, uh, you know, they had in-depth dialogue with the leaders of these organizations. They tried to look at the funding sources. They looked at the staffing. Who are the journalists who are leading these organizations? So I think a, a good faith effort is made to um, be sure that the, uh, the organization is going to produce content that's uh, quote unquote up to time standards, but I want to return to that. Uh, one of the problems that, that I've encountered in my role, uh, which sometimes seems to be reading other people's angry email <laughs> <laughs> primarily, is that there is an overwhelming climate of skepticism about, about, about news. And uh, there's, a, I think, a particularly deep skepticism about news at the New York Times, if my experience is any uh, indication of it. Um, the volume of, of, of email that I get, the number of blogs that comment on New York Times content, uh, just the general uh, volume and tone of, of criticism, I, I would say is uh, surprisingly strong. And one of the things I've found is that uh, when the not-for-profit content appears in the pages or on the web pages of the New York Times, an added ingredient enters into the equation, which seems to, for some, add an element of skepticism. It kind of works like this. I read the New York Times. I think it's a liberal organization. I find fault with this, that, or the other. And now I see that you're publishing content from, and then name one of the not-for-profit organizations that the Times does use, and, and I'll add a couple to the list I've already mentioned. It often uses content from ProPublica, Pro and it has used content from the Center for Public Integrity. When you introduce a new brand, to use Byron's term, which I think is a very good term, you introduce a new brand, that introduces a new element of the unknown for many readers. They may have, uh, they have known the New York Times, they know who is behind it, They've, Many of them understand that the Salzberger family has owned the New York Times uh, or, or led it uh, even during its public ownership period. They know who that group is and, and uh, they have an understanding and they can make their own assumptions. But when you introduce new and less well-known content producers, um, you get more skepticism. And one of the things that, that I have tried to say, and I've written a a couple of col columns trying to suggest this is that the introduction of new and less well-known, when, when it comes into in a confrontation with a climate of skepticism, translates into a much, much stronger need to transparently display as much as possible about these new content providers. Who are they? As Brandt is saying and, and Andy is saying, uh, it's important to declare who you are, who's your staff, How'd you get started? Who funds you? Do you have statements of principle? What are you all about? Because I, Joe Reeder, haven't known you since the 1890s. <laughs> You're new to me. And I think one of the things that happens is that people in journalism uh, have been suffused with a sense of altruistic mission from the cradle, I think. And so as they enter their tender 40-year-old stage, it doesn't occur to them that other people are deeply skeptical about them. But they are. It's unfortunate. We could have a, a wonderful, I'm sure, panel discussion about what's the origin of the skepticism. Let's just leave it that it's there. And in that climate, it becomes uh, compulsory to, uh, to display your information. And because of the nature of this uh, arrangement we're talking about. It, it's uh, nice if the not-for-profit news organization on its website does a good job of displaying these things. But it, on, it's incumbent, I think, as well as on the for-profit organization, the New York Times in this case, to make that information, at least as much as possible of it, available on its website. So when I wrote a column about this recently, in which I compared, I used the metaphor of the Ringing Brothers Circus with the big tent. There's a ringmaster out there, and then there are all these performers who come in, and people in the audience are wondering, ooh, that 
ProPublica clown is really entertaining, <laughs> but I didn't see him last year during the show, so what's up with that? No offense to ProPublica. Uh, probably more like the Lion Tamer would have been better for that one. Uh, the Times needs to display this kind of information, I think, more assertively and more clearly um, so that people have the opportunity to seek out what they can about the nature of the content provider, and so they can also see that the Times recognizes that they not, may not be as familiar. And the Times is communicating that we care about what you, dear reader, uh, think, and we understand that you may be skeptical. So I think that's um, an important thing to do. And I think it's underestimated in the current climate because of what I said about the suffusion of altruistic intent, that that isn't sufficient. You have to think practically about what the audience's expectations and biases might be. I'll end it with that. Okay, thank you, Art. Now that our panelists have uh, been able to uh, speak, we're going to get into a little bit more interactive part of the discussion. And I'd like for the audience to start thinking of some questions to ask, but I do have uh, uh, some follow-up questions. So uh, if the speakers are talking on something that you have a question about, just raise your hand and someone will give you a mic and uh, we'll start this interactive portion. Um, Art, I wanted to ask you uh, about how difficult it is to vet a new uh, organization. What does the New York Times look for when there's a new nonprofit organization and uh, they want to you know, have the New York Times publish their work? Um, I can only answer that to a degree because I, I, I don't know exactly how they go through it. Um, I can tell you that when I, when I spoke with the Times leadership about ProPublica and Center for Public Integrity, it was clear to me that uh, part of the, uh, uh, the discussion about ProPublica was the long relationships that existed between Times editors and Paul Steiger, who's the editorial leader at ProPublica, and Steven Engelberg, who is also a leader at ProPublica and who formerly worked for the New York Times. So personal relationships where they exist really facilitate uh, establishing a relationship. I know that um, the Times was building such a relationship with the Center for Public Integrity, but it was in an earlier stage. And so presumably that explains why perhaps not as many prominent pieces have been published. Uh, beyond that, you know, where you don't have um, personal relationships, you have reputations uh, and personal contact. And I think that's been a, uh, you know, a significant part of establishing an answer to the question, is this an organization that will perform to our standards? Um, I'm not sure that there's a great way to perform that evaluation, though. And I, uh, I, I said I'd come back to this. One of the columns I've written was about uh, how uh, news and opinion seem to intermingle in the pages of the Times. And um, I get a lot of mail on that. And I had a, uh, some mail about, uh, with that criticism, aimed at content from the Bay Citizen in particular. And there, you know, the question arises, okay, uh, I, this appears to be a highly editorial type of, uh, of item here in your news pages, and it's being produced by a third party uh, organization that I'm not acquainted with. Why have you permitted this third party outsourced content provider to stand up and you know, wave the flag of opinion. And I felt like, um, bottom line, this happened because the Times didn't really have a complete handle on how far it could go or how far it could allow this third party to, to go in, in that kind of writing. So I think the evaluation process is in, inevitably going to be um, less than perfect. Right, and, and the uh, financial portion of it, I mean, I'm sure that plays into it as well, like who they're getting their funding from, correct? Well, the third party, you yes. mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it raises the suspicion in people's minds. So if the complaint is, um, here's a, a piece in the paper 
that seems to take a political uh, a perspective from a part of the political spectrum. Um, uh, it's a third party. Uh, it's natural for the outside skeptic to think, well, that's because uh, the funders behind this organization share this perspective and they've found a way into the pages of the New York Times and how horrible can that be? That's the worst case scenario and that's where people tend to go, <laughs> right. I note. And, and any of the other panels, Brent or Andy, do you have any thoughts on that? Have you come across that? Oh, definitely, uh, we have at the Wisconsin Center. Uh, can I flash one thing up on the screen sure. quickly? Okay, so uh, we recently published a story uh, in which we uh, analyzed a uh, randomly generated sample of the emails to Governor Walker. Um, so obviously we're treading into very hot uh, p political issues uh, at the center. Um, so this was one of, the, one of the stories where I thought our decisions to clearly disclose our funders really, really came into play. Uh, and, it was, and it was very interesting, actually, to watch what happened once we published this report, which was picked up by several dozen news organizations across Wisconsin and across the country and even in several other countries. Um, if you look at the two main headlines or two main findings that, that flowed out of the analysis, uh, the first one was, in fact, Governor Walker uh, was accurately reporting the overall flow of the emails that, that arrived at his office that first week. By two to one margin, the emails favored uh, the governor's uh, budget repair bill uh, in his attempt to weaken the, uh, the public unions. However, we also, as part of our analysis, took a look at where the uh, emails appeared to come from. And we used several clues in the, in the mail, emails to try to figure out, was this person sending the email from in-state or out-of-state? And so it looked like, uh, according to our analysis, that a third of the governor's support was actually flowing here from out of state. So it was really interesting um, to uh, take a look at then uh, how that, how the reaction flowed. Um, and, how, and one of those emails, of course, that we stumbled across turned out to involve uh, Carlos Lamb, a GOP activist and assistant prosecutor in Indiana who had sent uh, an email to Governor Walker suggesting uh, that he stage a, a fake attack on the governor to discredit the union protesters. So we started seeing as the uh, information came in showing the different blogs that were linking to our stories and, and watching what was happening, um, the, the left-leaning blogs uh, were able to jump on the idea that, uh, look at that, a third of the governor's support is coming from out of state. Uh, and you know the governor had criticized union, out-of-state union thugs for coming in. Uh, so, so the left-leaning organizations drew that sort of um, finding out of our analysis, and the right-leaning organizations, of course, said, "Well, look at that. Uh, the governor was telling the truth, uh, and the um, emails, in fact, did tend to support uh, the governor's position." This one that's circled here is an example of one from a, a right-leaning blog called Media Trackers, which went on then to note that uh, the analysis was uh, performed uh, by the center, a watchdog organization funded by George Soros's Open Society Institute, among others. So in this case, they looked at our funders and said, okay, they're funded by a financier who funds a lot of uh, liberal causes. And they used that actually to say, well, if even they are saying the governor was telling the truth, then he must have really been telling the truth. So I found it interesting that in that case, the, um, it was used as a way of actually bolstering the credibility of our, of our findings, the fact that we were saying where our money was coming from. I just want to note that one of the things that we've stressed um, with members of the Investigative News Network is diverse sources of funding also strengthen your credibility. Uh, and you want to make sure that you have it coming from very different uh, parts of society. And, uh, and I think that's key because we live in a very, very political time.
uh, a lot of opinions and a lot of noise. And uh, as I said earlier, uh, the truth of an allegation doesn't really matter to a lot of people anymore. It's just getting the loudest allegation out and seeing how long it can ride and whether it can dominate the day. So um, you can't do any news now without coming under some attack or question. Um, you have your sincere readers, viewers, but you also have well-organized attack groups for political parties uh, coming after you all the time. Again, that's why credibility and saying at least I say where my funding comes from helps. Right. Well, I, I had two questions, but one was, uh, Brant, why uh, the $1,000 and above disclosure? Do you think you can't be bought for 500 or? <laughs> <laughs> um, what we had found, what we, we were encouraging as a network is everybody. Um, there are people that, there are large organizations that get thousands and thousands of donations and we're saying you should post them all on the website, which I don't think is such a bad idea, but we're also swimming upstream against a lot of, um, a lot of tradition. And so, you know, we're going to end up in discussions with people um, and organizations on why they really should disclose everything. Uh, yeah, some people go cheap, but usually they want more if they can get more. But, um, uh, but, but once I mean, again, once again uh, what's interesting to me is this sort of, each time we move ahead, there is always the golden age behind us. When I w started working for corporations, uh, the golden age were the family-owned newspapers. <laughs> In which, when I worked at a family-owned newspaper, the sacred cows I couldn't cover, everyone knew in town and never expected it. Uh, now we're moving to this, and oh, it was so great as corporations and advertising, where I thought we ended up with some of the most mediocre and distance reporting we had sometimes. Uh, and advertisers gained more and more influence, I believe, throughout the industry. It could have been nuanced, but you know, the, the process of keeping integrity and doing good stories is a constant struggle no matter what you have. So, you know, could somebody have been bought at one paper for a $500 ad? I don't know. I don't think so. I think they at least $1,000. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Karen, I'm really curious uh, really about who's not here. And you, you mentioned Sam Adams Franklin Center, and I didn't get the third one. And what was MacGyver. their reason? What was it? MacIver Institute. MacIver, like the MacIver on uh, <laughs> Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Um, but what, what, what did they say when you asked them? Um, Andy, do you want to yeah, address sure. that? Yeah, sure. I, I was uh, engaged in most of those discussions. Um, well, nobody uh, cited any philosophical objections to being here. Um, they simply said that no one would be available, that they were either scheduling conflicts or just generally that uh, no one would be available. Um, at this time to, uh, to appear on the panel. And I, you know, I, I, I would uh, say that we did extend the offer um, to any uh, employee or member of the board of directors of those three organizations. Um, and those contacts uh, began um, at least a couple months ago. Uh, so you know, we, um, as, as others have said, do regret uh, that, they're, yeah, and, that they're not here today. And I want to add why I thought it would be important. There have been many good journalists that I've worked with, award-winning journalists, they have gone to work for the Franklin Center and its state house efforts. And, um, and I think they're torn about the fact that, you know, they don't, their mothership does not disclose it. I think it would be, I also wanted, was hoping uh, they'd have the chance to talk about how they maintain uh, the integrity of what they're doing. I think their full name, Franklin Center for public and government integrity, government and public, government and public integrity. integrity. Um, I, I think those are pretty trustworthy uh, journalists. And in the end, the product is, tells you, uh, you know, what the validity is of it. But I also was hoping they'd be here because they've been rejected by state house bureaus, uh, the uh, state house groups, state house reporter groups, and have not been given office space within those, those bureaus. And so it's been a real issue. It has been the first, uh, uh, one of the first real issues of the new nonprofit world. And, you know, they're being viewed as, uh, as possibly a tool of more conservative and libertarian views. 
but I have not seen any content study of that. So I was really hoping they get the chance to talk about we can do this and so forth. And one other thing I wanted to mention is there are some good things about the old ways. I'm puzzled why some of the nonprofits um, can't simply split their opinion from their news, label it as such, so that people would have a better feel, um, you know, for what is there, and it would it would allow a distance, and for the reporters working for it, whether it's uh, you know liberally funded or conservatively funded, to say we have our independence, and this is how we maintain our independence. Right. Good question. So I spoke as much as I could for them. <laughs> uh, we have another question in the back. Uh, so I, I kind of have a big question that ties the last panel into, the, or tries to tie the last panel into this one. It's a, um, a question about uh, uh, diversity of funding and, and the fact that that is a good thing for kind of maintaining or, uh, a broader public interest. Um, the question is how that applies to kind of large scale foundation funding as well as individual donor funding. Um, so if you guys could kind of touch on that. I'm not quite sure I completely understood it. So, in other, I think I got it, but say one a little bit. So, the idea is that it's easy to kind of represent um, that your funding is very diverse on a scale if you're looking at, um, at maybe foundations that, that span the spectrum. Um, is that possible with individual donors? And uh, is there a model that, that hits at a broad individual donor base? Um, is that possible? Is that something that uh, investigative uh, networks like your guys is are moving towards is it is it desirable or is it just the commercial system you're you're saying diverse funding in terms of getting many donors yeah. not just foundations in, but in the range of them, in the right. range of them. yeah I, I mean I think the di diversity of the funding helps your credibility uh, because it doesn't look like you're owned by anyone whether it's foundation or individual donors that you're owned by one group in some way uh, whether it's a group of foundations, a foundation, or a group of individual donors. The more, the more you have, the, it becomes clear to people the less influence that one group or one person can have. And the only thing I could add to that is uh, that, you know, as we uh, develop our own um, fundraising strategies, we do take into account um, that issue, and, and we do seek out uh, donors uh, from the full range of the political spectrum, both uh, foundations um, and individuals. And of course, um, with regard to the donations, um, we uh, emphasize uh, the importance of uh, donations that don't have strings attached, that leave us free to, to carry out our, uh, our mission with the maximum possible freedom. I just wanted to add the thought that when I look at the lists of donors um, of some of the nonprofit journalism organizations that I've, that I've looked at, and also when I think back on my own experience, which was brief in, in trying to raise funds for the, for the Neiman Foundation, one of the things I have tended to see is that the kinds of uh, foundations that give money to journalism occupy what appears to be a middle to left leaning political spectrum. And you don't see a lot of conservative organizations popping up supporting the kind of journalism we're talking about here today. And I think that's a bit of a problem in that it, finding a way to bring that part of the spectrum into the tent would go a distance toward curing uh, what it may not be yet a problem, but will be a problem. And that is the belief that this whole sector, not-for-profit journalism, is a creature of the left. I, I can see that around the bend if it's not here yet. Yeah, and so far it, it appears the more conservative foundations uh, prefer to act as operating foundations. That is, that you basically call the shots on what's being done and yeah. you're not giving grants out, you are forming particular groups. And, um, and so that, that's been the tendency. Yeah. Yeah, I actually had a question. Um, as readers, I think those of us in this room would probably tend not to trust non-disclosed or, or information from sites that don't disclose donors, but most people probably never even think about that. Is there any way that, say, the investigative news network is going to put that 
front and center so that readers are more sophisticated in what they consume? Yeah, there is a, a, there is a sector we're working in called best practices and that we want to publicize what, um, you know, are some of the best proven practices and that would be, you know, disclosing, uh, you know, where you're coming from, where the money is and so forth. I mean, I think people tend to make this a very binary kind of process, but even foundations that seem to have a clear purpose have nuanced uh, visions of things. And so, you know, it's, it's just not an open shut thing. I think if anyone's done fundraising, um, you'll find that you'll go to some people who say, I'm going to give you the money, I want this done, and you go, well, that's not how it's going to happen. Or you'll go to somebody who says, I'll give you a lot of money, I don't care what you do, but they'll use my name. Um, you know, we're, you have a lot more journalists engaged in the business side of nonprofits than ever before, and there is, a, there is quite a culture shock going on at this point. Uh, while we're waiting for another question, uh, I wanted to ask, how prevalent are anonymous donors, and when you get approached by someone who wants to be anonymous, what is your response? I can use one from my previous life when I was at Investigative Reporters and Editors. Uh, that has a 13-member elected board, and there was never an agreement uh, on whether you could do undercover work or not. Uh, so it was hard for the IRE, as it was known, to even have an ethics policy, since you had some people saying undercover work is good or bad. In terms of fundraising, uh, one sector of the board, uh, it may have changed a little bit, but there was one small sector of the board that thought all money is evil. Um, <laughs> and I wasn't quite sure how you pay the bills if all money is evil, but, they, you know, it took no donations whatsoever, and um, there's a, a very um, sort of hit or miss fundraising policy. Then, at the other end was, we'll take money from anyone, but if they try to tell us what to do with it, we'll throw it back in their face. This wasn't a good fundraising policy overall. We, we developed a better <laughs> one. Um, but no one really wanted an anonymous donor ever, not for IRE. Well, here's how life gets difficult and why everyone can teach ethics for a long time. Uh, there was an anonymous donor and that donor did not want their name known uh, at all. But what they wanted to do is give $50,000 uh, to support freelance investigative reporting. They would have no say over it. There would be an independent three-person committee that would have this pot of money or the investments from it to give out. And the idea of the anonymous donor would be sitting out here, maybe give some more money down the line if things, you know, were going well. Uh, but um, eventually the IRE board agreed to this because it was hard to say and would disclose every detail of this except the anonymous donor. In fact, I think only two people in the organization know the name of the anonymous donor. Um, you know, there is a situation. Who would turn that down? Here is 50000 there is no influence. We're going to tell exactly how it happens. You can see the entire process. Um, and so that, you know, even where you had a board that tended to be one way or the other, it was like, what are we going to do? Deny hardworking journalists who have a panel of experts. They're going to decide on it. The anonymous donor will read it in the newsletter. That's how they're going to find out. And that's it. And it was understood if the anonymous donor ever tried to exert the slightest bit of influence, then the money would be returned. Seems to have worked out for the last four or five years. And I think with the Investigative News Network, we've uh, looked at applications now from more than 50 either current members or applicants, and I can recall maybe four or five uh, situations have been mentioned in those applications where the organization had a history mm -hmm. of accepting uh, some anonymous contributions and at least in one case it, it seemed to be a substantial number, which I think is something that's and, being sorted. And, and once again, we're living in an environment, take universities. Universities, I mean anonymous donors are all over, um, you know, all over their annual reports. Right. So we've got a tradition but you have different purposes now. So. Uh, 
When receiving money from donors, uh, does it, uh, do you have any issues with uh, the specificity of the donation? For example, if someone wants to give money specifically for uh, the educational aspects or for environmental, uh, you know, specific topics, uh, how specific does a gift have to be uh, oriented to where it becomes a problem? I'll, I'll take a crack at that one first, um, Herman, uh, yet another board member from the Wisconsin Center. So, um, in our case, uh, we have defined within our fundraising policy um, the, our core areas of coverage, and we have said uh, that we'll accept uh, donations targeted toward those core areas, such as coverage of uh, education or the environment, public integrity, and so forth. Um, if, so, if a donor came to us and said, and, and named some other area of coverage, we'd have to have a serious discussion among the board members whether that seemed to be also appropriate and in line with the center's overall mission um, or not. Um, we uh, furthermore uh, would, would disclose as we would produce that coverage, education coverage or whatever would flow from that, uh, the names of donors who had directed money that direct in, the, in that fashion. Um, and then, of course, uh, the, the diciest of all is a situation where we have a particular project in mind and uh, a donor wants to fund that. Um, and there have been cases at, the, at some other centers, this hasn't happened with us yet, but there have been cases where donors have come to the center with the idea for the project that they wanted to fund. Um, and you have to be extremely cautious in those situations not to get into a tail wagging the dog uh, situation. And it has, it has to be a project that's in line with the organization's purpose and um, all the, uh, the, the conditions that are attached uh, to the funding uh, need to be uh, disclosed along with the coverage so that the public can assess the, uh, the credibility of it. Okay, we had another question. Thank you. Um, when you take a look at the University of Wisconsin, you think about the foundation building up on University Avenue and all the people that work in there and what they call donor relations. How human intensive is it for you to go through what I see to be the gyrations of getting a donor to the point at which they're going to give the most and they're comfortable checking their backgrounds? I mean, how much does it take from what you have left in human resources to actually do the journalism once you handle donor relations before and after the money comes in. That's a good story, and that's that's a you know a serious issue uh, to try to uh, juggle the you know the business side of the uh, operation while keeping the journalism strong. Um, you know, we just, we Brant and I were just at a meeting with uh, what about 15 or so uh, nonprofit investigative centers uh, last weekend, and. Everybody there um, has trouble finding the, the time to, to um, go out and, and form those connections and sorts of things you're talking about, uh, donor development is labor intensive, uh, as it should be. Uh, the donor needs to know a lot about us and feel comfortable with us um, and, and, and vice versa. So it's always, that part of it is always going to take time. Uh, you know, we, we do also work with fundraising professionals. Most of our organizations, once we get up to maybe 150 or $200,000 a year budgets, part of that budget goes uh, then to, to working with fundraising consultants, development consultants, um, or uh, at least creating part-time staff positions. And quite, quite frankly, I don't think there's been much individual uh, donor development or outreach uh, because it is so labor intensive. That's why the foundations have been key to giving start money. Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation of Oklahoma City, which is a sponsor of this, um, is making it possible for a lot of centers to get going, to see if they can build up, and then decide. I mean, we're not even, for universities, it's very much an ongoing process all, all the time to maintain the institution. Um, a lot of the centers just need to get the word out that they exist. <laughs> That's just a, so, you know, it's not even a matter of cultivation of donors. It's just, we're here, we're doing this work. There's so much information out on the web. There's, and most of the centers are online news operations. So, uh, 
Uh, that is a big factor. Uh, you know, you can take a lot of time getting an office lease. <laughs> and um, people discovered that. Um, you've spent a lot of time talking about financial transparency, and that makes a lot of sense to me. But it seems to me that one of the reasons that there's such deep public skepticism about what we do professionally doesn't have as much to do with who pays for our work as how it is that we select the stories that we do and how it is that we choose to frame the stories in the way that we frame them and so forth and so on. That's a different kind of transparency. And while I know that people like to draw a real firm line between money and pay for play, if you will, it's never that easy. So I'd like for all of you to talk a little bit about have you thought about different kinds of transparency, the transparency about the process of doing journalism, of actually asking for suggestions from people about projects that should be undertaken, and I'll now shut up. <laughs> Good question. Who wants to take that one first? Sure. Well, let me just mention that that's at the forefront of uh, everyone's mind because of a project called Spot Us, which is asking people to suggest stories uh, but also having reporters suggest stories and see if anybody would be interested in funding them. Uh, that's a whole nother, you know, you, you know, you can get on thin ice with that. But the idea that you're bringing up is, is really getting back to the community and being in touch with the community. And that's the way, only way I think these, the state and regional centers and institutions and newsrooms are going to continue to exist. What happened in my in my view of being in the middle of it in the 80s and 90s is that the newspaper and its building itself became more of a fortress on the on the hill and with staff cuts people became more telephonalist than journalist uh, you know there just wasn't that interaction uh, and uh, you know I, I did consulting for various newsrooms and I would have to wait an hour at security to get in and they were paying me to come in and train uh, I can't imagine what it would be like to be the public. So I think what you're really touching on is a much larger issue. It's what you're doing is meaningful, is it relevant, are you listening, is, are you getting information back and not just lecturing? And I think that's the, that's, that's the way that you resolve that one. I think, it, I think it's a really excellent question in, in part because I think there's a tendency uh, in news organizations, and I think this would be as true for pro for profit as non profit, to um, fail to examine your own starting place, uh, which is really what I think the questioner means when she's referring to framing. You know, what point of reference do I have that has uh, inspired me to think this is a story? We often don't ask ourselves, what point of reference do I have? We just look for stories, unaware that from out in the audience, there's a point of view that, gosh, that seems like uh, politically uh, inspired to me. That seems like that's coming from here or coming from there, whereas we thought it's coming from the, you know, ground zero of of, of truth and impartiality and balance and all these other buzz phrases. So, what do we need to do to to uh, examine the question? Where is our point of reference? And should it be broader? Should it be elsewhere? What kind of input do we need to invite to get an answer to that question? So I think part of what organizations need to do is to consult the public. How do you consult the public? It's kind of a tough question. Um, and there are probably a lot of ways to do it. And most organizations don't think to do it. They don't have a mechanism for doing it. Instead, they occupy a geographic location. In, in the New York Times case, it's New York City primarily. Everybody comes to work in the building. Their point of view is shaped largely by their place, the attitudes of their colleagues. How do they get a point of view outside that? It needs to be a really rigorous uh, well, approach. Well, and I find it ironic, though, that we are having to talk about it, but that's the irony I found in the 80s and 90s as it became more corporate, people migrated from job to job. You, you weren't out in the community. When I started out, going back in the 70s, I was out in the community all the time. I ate breakfast, I was around people. Uh, it was a smaller paper. Somebody had a problem with a story that I had written. 
they walked into the newsroom and wanted to really talk to me about it. So I never felt I was out of touch or if it's a breakfast or at lunch or whatever. And so that's where we lost it. And that's why I'm hopeful with these um, new newsrooms we have now that there'll be a desire and much more activity. Um, you know, it cracked, it, it cracked me up in a very bad way in, a, in, in that we started doing focus groups at the Hartford Current. What do the readers want? And I thought, well, how about getting everybody out of the newsroom for the entire day, and I bet we'll really come back with a lot of good information. Uh, so, but yeah. that's our, I mean, that, that's what happened to us. Yeah, yeah it's a, it's a yeah. And by the way, this will probably have to be the last question. We're running out of time. Am I on? Yes, I am. And um, I'm really glad to hear you say that when we, I work directly with public radio stations around the country, and um, when we talk to them about, we talk to them about turning outward, we talk about listening to communities, um, this, these, uh, it includes news talk stations, actually a lot of um, NPR affiliates within the last year have hired people specifically to do community relations, and I would argue with you a bit, we did used to do that in newspapers and public broadcasting, we called it ascertainment, that was a mechanism, that was a way for us in media to, uh, it, w it was a mechanism for us to listen to communities. My question is sort of piggybacking on the, on the madam who spoke before, who spoke before and asked, which is, how do you report back to your donors about your um, project? I think this is something especially for um, public broadcasting, which is how do we communicate the impact and the value of our work? And if you're talking to people who are funding um, your content and your, your raison d'etre um, with your product, how do you communicate that impact back to them to demonstrate the value of the work? Sure. Um, I'll, just, I'll take a crack at that first. Um, you know, all donors uh, want to know, and, and, and potential donors want to know, um, w is, this, is this having impact? Um, so, news org all the nonprofit news organizations uh, struggle with this issue to compile metrics, basically. Um, so, yeah, we, we produce, uh, uh, you know, go do uh, Google Watches and, uh, and compile a pretty extensive list of where our coverage is picked up and by whom and in what form it appears. Uh, so that's, that's one form of metric. How many eyeballs uh, or, or sets of ears got onto that story? That, and we routinely report that back to uh, foundations and individuals. In addition, um, measuring impact, uh, did, did the publication of that story change anybody's behavior? Or did it raise public awareness? You know, and that could range from formal change in legislation or somebody resigned uh, to uh, simply getting people to talk about it and you know, watching uh, the conversations pop up around the, uh, around the state. Uh, so all, all, of those, um, all of those methods are, are being used by us, and we're also trying to continue those conversations with the public through social media. Okay, yeah. well, we... No, I, I think people Can are... Can anyone answer in, in one minute? Yeah, yeah, I'll do it really quick. Uh, the Texas Tribune, which is doing work for the New York Times, has over 100 corporate sponsors, has uh, guidelines and how they're, you know, don't, do not influence the news. I think for some of the younger organizations, the idea was a little bit shocking. Uh, but they're, once again, you know, you get into a new field, you think maybe you're inventing everything when it turns out there are some standards already there. So that's, I think that is becoming, a, you know, part of the discussion. Okay, well thank you. We're all out of time. Thank you to each one of you in the audience and for the questions and thank you to our panelists.